All right, good afternoon, everyone. We want to welcome you to today's special topic webinar on mosquito-borne disease risk in Baltimore, Maryland. Before we get started, I have a few rules to go over. Please, everyone, mute your line. Um, you can ask the chat box to ask any questions, and they'll all be answered at the end of the webinar. If you have any additional questions um, that are not answered, you can email them to us at education at nola.gov. And today's webinar will not be offering CEUs. Next, we'll have Dr. Regal, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Astasia. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And a huge thank you to Dr. Shannon Ledoux, who's going to be joining us today to present the seminar. And uh, about our speaker, she finished her PhD at Duke University, and she's currently a senior scientist and a GE Hutchinson Chair in Ecology at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook, New York. Um, her research examines how climate and human led human land use influence ecological communities associated with vertebrate disease risk. So we're very excited. Actually, we've um, just a little bit of from our standpoint, we had her down here not too long ago looking at our program, also working with some of our partners here in our region. So we're very excited. We were picking your brain, you know, because she's done a lot of work with mosquito uh, control and um, looking at interesting situations in Baltimore and other areas. So again, we are so grateful to have you, Shannon, for um, our webinar and, you know, take it away. Thank you again. You're on mute. So, Shannon, you're going to have to unmute yourself. <laughs> All right. Is that better? Can you hear me yes, now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes thank you. you. Okay. Thank you again for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. I am uh, going to start sharing. And hopefully, OK, so then. All right, uh, mine went to slideshow and yours did not. Um, let's see. So yours, I think, is not moving. Yeah. Stacy, uh, any suggestions? Stacy is good at this. Says it's presenting. So make sure that you chose PowerPoint and not the window. Um. Okay, maybe that's when it. you when you shared. So right. I did exactly go. that. Yeah. So right. So now <laughs> we're on your um, second slide. Yep. Okay, okay, so okay, first slide. There we go. Thank you all for joining. Um, I am in New York right now at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, but the work I'm going to talk about is out of Baltimore. And bear with me, I wasn't sure exactly who would be on the call. And so there's some kind of general introduction and then more uh, specifics about, about the research. Um, the research is the culmination of and it's actually still ongoing, but a lot of different people's input. Um, and I like to acknowledge them up front. Paul Leisman at University of Maryland, who's an entomologist and uh, mosquito expert, as well as environmental justice experts, Don Billier and Jacoby Wilson at the University of Maryland, um, Baltimore County and College Park campuses, uh, and citizen science expert in community engagement, participatory engagement, um, the, the kind of terminology around that field has really evolved since 2012 when we started this. Uh, Rebecca Jordan, who's now at MSU, as well as uh, collaborators at Rutgers, Dina Fonseca and Andrea Gacy, and a whole bunch of masters, undergrad and PhD students, as well as one high school intern um, that have contributed. And, and I'll try to acknowledge folks as I go. Um, but, it, but it's actually been the work of a lot of people. And I also want to say up front that Baltimore City Department of Public Works and the um, environmental health departments have also been engaged at various points. Um, and I want to remember to point this out early because what has not been engaged has been any control agency through Baltimore. The city does not have um, a mosquito control or pest control per se, 
um, specifically, it's kind of under the umbrella of environmental health and not something that the city's uh, generally been been structured to deal with, um, which has been interesting. So I'm going to talk broadly about arboviral transmission. And so I just wanted to do a little definition kind of up front of the, the kind of terminology I'll, I'll use. Um, in general, uh, zoonotic arbovirus are things like West Nile virus, and so that's what a lot of the um, mosquito control and mosquito research in the United States has tended to focus on um, some these kind of zoonotic arboviruses. That's what has been um, more, more recently in the past several decades, that's been the source of mosquito-borne risk. Uh, for humans in the U.S. And these are um, viruses that uh, amplify in vertebrate hosts that aren't human. So in West Nile virus, it's a bird predominantly. And so a mosquito bites a bird and picks up the virus and then bites another bird. And the virus then amplifies in the environment and builds up in the environment. And occasionally it spills over into humans. It's a very rare event, luckily. And that's why we don't see um, we don't often see things like West Nile virus become huge epidemic outbreaks because it's really limited by that complex interaction of a mosquito having to bite a bird, pick up a virus, survive long enough for that virus to amplify in the mosquito or to replicate in the mosquito. And then the mosquito has got to choose to bite a human. And, and luckily that kind of um, mismatch in, in what they're biting doesn't happen all that frequently. And so it's a, a limited transmission. It's also something that's really hard to get rid of. You can't just quarantine or separate humans and mosquitoes and hope to end the cycle in the environment because it survives in that non-human vertebrate reservoir. Um, there's also a, a suite of mosquito-borne diseases that while originally were zoonotic in in having a non-human vertebrate reservoir. Um, they are currently perfectly fine being transmitted directly between mosquitoes and humans. So the humans themselves are, are the reservoir for these. Um, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, Zika. We've certainly all heard more about those in recent decades. And well, predominantly of greatest concern in warmer tropical environments where the mosquito life cycle can allow for viral uh, transmission to be ongoing all year, we're increasingly seeing uh, outbreaks and local transmission in predominantly urban areas uh, in the US. And so while, while the urban transmission, that is mostly transmission that doesn't require a zoonotic reservoir, is increasing globally, we're also seeing increase into temperate regions. Um, and albeit the, the more tropical parts of those temperate regions um, as listed here. So you see dengue, chikungunya, Zika, these are outbreaks with local known local transmission, um, which have uh, really been much more frequent in the last decade than in the previous decades. Of course, uh, most of these are transmitted by, by Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito. Uh, dengue virus is the most uh, prominent and has, has the highest morbidity and mortality across the globe right now for urban areas. Um, and we don't, tend, we, we don't tend to worry about dengue or Aedes aegypti in most of the temperate region. Um, it, it is more sensitive to cold temperatures and and yet it can't just be cold temperatures right there used to be uh, mosquito-borne diseases that were very frequently the cause of outbreaks in this map here is from um, a paper from 2018 but it shows the u.s and these are specifically yellow fever outbreaks uh, across uh, the northeast and and Gulf uh, Coast of the U.S. And so we know that that in the early history of our country, there were a lot more mosquito-borne outbreaks. And so we know that this species um, could certainly survive and be problematic north of where it is. 
And we also know that the reason it's not is a lot of the human infrastructure that's been put in place to um, separate urban populations from a lot of nature, including 100 years of water removal and water security um, that removed a lot of exposure for urban residents to uh, waterborne disease, but also removed a lot of potential for mosquito habitat and for flooding and resultant mosquito habitat. Um, and so this is a picture from a watershed in Baltimore and all of the little lines on it show places where there used to be streams. And the thick lines are the streams that um, were allowed to remain after the mid 1800s and everything else was buried. And so across cities across the US, um, impervious surfaces were used and 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 sewer systems were used to, to really remove water from uh, the daily lives of, of most people at the same time as providing drinking water, potable water. Um, and so that water security means that people didn't have to store water either. Um, and that's really separated the kind of urbanization process in the US and, and the temperate area um, from from less developed, more rural areas and from some of the, the less developed uh, tropical areas, which is just another layer on top of having seasonality like winter that really has reduced exposure to mosquitoes. And then, of course, the, the real death knell for Aedes aegypti in most of the temperate region was uh, the use of DDT, which was very effective, of course, in killing mosquitoes uh, and and is now banned in the US, but also something that, that many of the mosquito species have developed um, resistance to, even as they move northward back into the US where, where DDT is banned and is, um, hasn't been used since the 70s. And finally, the suburbanization after 1950s was the, the other uh, component of this infrastructural change that really altered mosquito exposure for residents in the United States and in uh, a lot of urban areas across the globe where where the building style and specifically air conditioning and screens um, became much more common and you put a much higher part of the population into those those containers that separate them from mosquitoes and it it's also really um, been very effective. Now that's all to say uh, that that things have been very effective, but there's also a lot about that way of of kind of building a sanitary city that that we now recognize uh, has other consequences for human health. And and so I'm sure it, uh, everyone's familiar with uh, more recent pushes to green our cities, to read daylight the water, um, add water back into that that urban infrastructure, add nature back into that urban infrastructure. Um, and there are many health benefits for that. And I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna, gonna try to acknowledge all of those, but I wanna say up front that that today I'm gonna talk about some downsides and it's not to suggest that they um, should be weighed more heavily than the numerous and in increasingly discovered um, positive aspects of bringing nature back into the city. Um, and so these are these are maps. So the top one is that same yellow fever mosquito. And again, I'm I'm highlighting here. This is a map from Kramer, 2015. That that there's a real hard kind of northern limit to where we're we're still seeing this mosquito, although it pops up uh, in temperate regions. And there's there's evidence that it is established. It's certainly established in New Orleans. Um, but today we're going to talk more about this second mosquito, which has only been globally dispersed since the mid 80s and is um, capable of transmitting all the same viruses as the yellow fever mosquito, but it is much more tolerant of cool seasonality um, and winter conditions. As you can see here, it's, it's much more abundant across uh, the US East Coast. Um, although it's it's spreading fairly rapidly. So the tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, like Aedes aegypti, was originally sylvatic um, and had uh, a, this would be a tree hole mosquito that would have bred in things like these bamboo holes here. 
Um, it breeds by, uh, it reproduces by laying these eggs that are in the picture here that are very resistant to dr being dry. And when tire factories started storing tires before exporting in areas that were very close to wooded areas, uh, the understanding is that the mosquitoes laid their eggs in the tires. The tires were then dispersed across the globe, and and now we have tiger mosquito across the, um, across the globe. Um, it is an opportunistic feeder. It it will bite what's most common. Um, it does seem to bite mammals more readily than than other animals. Um, but the more it's studied, the more it is found to be willing to bite what is common. Um, unlike Aedes aegypti, it does not always uh, seem to, it, it, fewer of the studies seem to suggest a focus on humans, right? So it's biting much more opportunistically and at the moment, although every new study provides uh, new information that, that seems to suggest it, it's very adaptable and changing quite quickly. So mosquitoes have a complex life cycle. I'm an ecologist, I'm a community ecologist. Most of my work is um, aimed at trying to understand how the, the different interactions that occur um, among species and with different contextualized climate and land use uh, environments influence the function of, of the system. And so in, in the mosquito case, the, the juveniles require water, that aquatic habitat, um, it has to be persistent long enough for the juveniles to, to go from the egg stage through to an emergent adult. Uh, all of that happens faster as you warm it up, but of course there's some threshold after which it becomes too hot, um, the water evaporates and um, or is, is thermally uh, not conducive with life. And there has to be food in the water for the juveniles to grow. And most often that's, that's initially seeded by plant detritus, um, but an entire microbial community uh, builds up that, and, and fungal community and algal community um, over time that all influence how those juveniles grow. So there's a whole aquatic habitat that drives the juvenile development. That's really important for what species of mosquitoes you find in a location and, how, and the fitness of those mosquitoes, as well as the abundance. As the, an adult, the mosquito also needs plants. Um, males feed on plant nectar uh, and sugars, and plants provide uh, microclimate adjustments for humidity and heat, shade. Uh, the adults are much more sensitive to swings in uh, climate, microclimate, than, than the juveniles are. And, uh, and, and of course, the female requires most species of blood meal in order to produce eggs. And uh, some species will focus on specific types of animals for those blood meals and others are more opportunistic. The tiger mosquito um, has been, I, I've said it's competent for, for several of the same arboviruses, those, those viruses that have adapted to be directly transmitted by humans. Um, as Aedes aegypti, and one of the the data points is is exemplified here from this 2018 paper that highlights a 2014 outbreak in Japan that was really centered around parks in in the city of Tokyo, um, and was uh, entirely uh, Aedes albopictus, the tiger mosquito, was the vector implicated in transmission of this outbreak. Um, the parks are important because Aedes albopictus does, uh, seems more sensitive to drying and the kind of impervious surface conditions that Aedes aegypti is much more adapted to surviving. Um, and, and this is a, a more temperate region and aegypti is not as common, but the, the outbreaks were, were predominantly around parks, um, which is where people tend to go to find nature in the city and not necessarily to be infected by nature. Um, it, it's not something we necessarily built into our framework for understanding how we can add nature back into the city. Um, so to 
the rest of the, the talk, I'm going to talk about this case study, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. We started working in Baltimore partially because that's where several of us were located, but also because the Natural Science National Science Foundation supported an LTR site there. So there was good infrastructure for interacting with uh, community groups and, and other researchers in the city. Um, and Baltimore also has this very fine scale neighborhood heterogeneity where you can walk from one neighborhood to the next within two kilometers and, and have a really different environment. Um, this is from the neighborhood, um, it's from the, the Baltimore city, but neighborhood health indicators and the different neighbors or neighborhoods are outlined here and they go from red with a, a minimum life expectancy at birth of 66 up to these green areas more on the outskirts that that can max out closer to 86. So this 20 year span in life expectancy just within the city and, and really within walking distance from one neighborhood to the next. And a lot of that is lined up with um, what's become known as redlining, the legacy of redlining. Uh, here I put the, the Hulk security zone map, uh, which was the federally funded and supported um, system of ranking parts of cities in the uh, uh, post-World War One and, and World War II era, but, but often into the 60s and, and early 70s um, to guide banks in where to lend money for purchasing homes. And, and so they, they had this ranking and red here is hazardous. These are parts of Baltimore City that were deemed hazardous by this ranking, um, this, this federally supported ranking. And, you know, it's no surprise now that, that these were all, um, these were predominantly neighborhoods that were at at the time African American um, in other cities, maybe different minorities, but they were minority neighborhoods um, in zones that that were deemed too hazardous to invest in home ownership. And this this is really um, had these persistent impacts on the quality of life in these neighborhoods, but the accumulation of wealth in the neighborhood, not just of the individuals who may move in and out, but but the investment and, and accumulation of wealth um, in the infrastructure that, that stays in these neighborhoods. And we went in wanting to know how that um, current measure, cur how current measures of neighborhood wealth and the, the kind of legacy of municipal investment would influence the mosquito populations in and across the city. And the legacy of disinvestment is very visual. And so we went into this largely because we drove around Baltimore and saw things that look a lot like this, which um, are, are very clearly providing water habitat for mosquitoes. And one of the things I want to point out with this picture is these pictures is um, you know, the, the the disinvestments at various stages, a lot of it, you know, this this top here is a building that uh, the roof went and then they couldn't sell the house anymore. But somebody still lives at the, the kind of left hand side here. That's still somebody's home on the left hand side. And the same thing down here in the bottom right, you'll see this kind of stark line between where there's this dumping of garbage in this one backyard. This paved area over here to the right is just another person's backyard. Somebody lives there. And so a lot of the the, the differences in some of these neighborhoods with the highest um, legacy of disinvestment or abandonment are are not complete. There's people that still live there and their their homes, their yards tend to be um, paved, but but where you don't find vegetation, you don't find trash. And the trash is not litter. It's not something that the neighbors have a lot of control over. It is trash that's accumulated either because the buildings have been abandoned and things have been dumped outside um, post abandonment before they pull them down, or because there's not enough eyes on the, the, the ground to keep illegal dumping out. So people drive into these neighborhoods and leave trash. We went in um, for four years in a row and we've got the 
one nice thing about Baltimore is all these row homes. And so it's very easy to go in and know what parcel is what. And there's not a lot of room in between them. They're row homes and there's a lot of shared space um, behind or uh, in the in the inter inter home areas. And. And so we went to every single parcel across neighborhoods that were a priori selected to be um, relative to the Baltimore median income at that time, either below it, at it, or above it. Um, and we we looked at all the uh, mosquitoes, both the juveniles in in kind of water holding container habitats on all the parcels. And we did BG Sentinel trapping for adults uh, every third week for 48 hours um, on, on each of our focal blocks in these neighborhoods. And I'm going to kind of refer to the neighborhoods as as above, median, or below the the socioeconomic status um, as so socioeconomic status groupings in some of these um, because there's a lot more complexity to how they ended up parsing out than was represented by just our a priori median income um, designation. Um, and so just some quick summaries uh, here. The dark circles are Culex, and those are both Pipians and Restuans. Um, and uh, the open circles are Aedes albopictus. Uh, the y-axis is females per trap night or per, per trap 24 hours. These traps were set out um, again for 48 hours uh, to catch uh, uh, the day biting mosquitoes as well as the, the evening and night. And then our, our X axis goes from the below income or lowest socioeconomic status neighborhood grouping up to the above. And basically what you can see is there's a very clear um, difference in uh, the numbers of adult females per trap night in, in the 80s albopictus. It's less evident in the Culex, although Culex is highest in both the low and the um, high. So you see some loss of Aedes albopictus as you increase the wealth status of the neighborhood, and uh, you don't see that with Culex. Um, but you do see some loss in the median income neighborhoods, which which I'll explain a little bit um, as we go on. But most of the talk now, we're going to move into just focusing in on the 80s albopictus because the differences were so stark. Um, most of the patterns were consistent with the Culex, but once you tease apart Pipians and Restuans and the different seasonality, when we see them, the patterns were a little bit harder to, um, to summarize quickly. So again, here we have May through September. This is for uh, three different years. Females 80s albopictus is on the y-axis. You'll see these numbers are quite high. We've got traps where we're getting 100 or more female albopictus um, per 24 hours. And these are averaged across uh, all the traps in our neighborhoods. The black is the um, below median or the low socioeconomic status, and the red is the high. And we get, at its peak, three times more mosquitoes in our lower socioeconomic status um, neighborhoods. I will say that, that you know, even our high socioeconomic status neighborhoods were getting at its peak close to 50 um, mosquitoes per day, which is not a trivial amount to be dealing with. Um, we also, and this is work by Danielle Bodner, who is a master's student working with Paul Leisman and I, found that the number of positive discarded or trash containers per parcel, um, whether it's an inhabited parcel or not, is a positive predictor of the number of female 80s albopictus um, on that block. So at the block scale, the number of discarded containers per parcel is a predictor of how many um, female mosquitoes on that block. And that, you know, initially was very exciting. It gives us something pretty, pretty clear to test. Um, it's consistent with the idea that um, most public health and mosquito agencies have used regarding the 80s species of mosquitoes strategy, um, which is which is that they're breeding in small containers that are very difficult to control at that level. And so residents have to remove container habitat. That's going to be the most effective thing you can do. Um, we decided to go in and do it at the block scale and see if we could remove all the container habitat 
and um, you know, and and reduce this and get get our blocks back down to the the uh, lower Aedes allopictus numbers. And, and so these are some pictures from the blocks. We we set up two control blocks and two treatment blocks that were right next to each other. Um, so two control a control and a treatment right next to each other, and then you know several blocks away another control and treatment right next to each other. Um, the things they had in common were they all had some abandoned buildings on them. Um, these were all in our lower income areas. And and so we we hoped that it would be the great opportunity to remove a whole bunch of container habitat um, and really see a big effect. Um, and when container habitat like this, this post, you can't remove it, we uh, screened it. We put a screen on it. Um, and we didn't have things that were too big to remove in these um, habitats. Th these aren't areas where there's a pool or anything like that. Um, again, we had help from, ooh, I'm sorry. We had help from DPW and um, they, the, you, with the dumpsters and with wheelbarrows and stuff to, to get it all done. These are pictures um, of the group removing it. We removed these like a full, it was pretty terrible actually, but we removed like entire dumpsters for each block. Um, and the control blocks, we did nothing. And these are pictures of, of like after pictures. You can see where it's much cleaner. You can't see the garbage. And here's a picture of a fence pole with our our special screening. OK, so our control sites, we, we went out and we put the, we use BG Sentinel traps and we had them set out two per block before the intervention. We did the intervention was this is a shaded area and then we uh, monitored for another two weeks after the intervention and you can see here at the control sites you know it was relatively high before the intervention it may not have changed much um, during the time period at which we uh, did this there, there was no intervention on these control plots um, it may have gone down a little but it bounces around we really ex hoped to see things get better in the plots where we removed literally huge dumpsters of garbage. And, and this is these are the data from from those plots. So our treatment plots, we actually increased. There was an increase in mosquito populations. So this was really demoralizing. Um, on the plus side, we removed a lot of garbage and. You know, that can't be bad, um, but on, on it does call into question some understanding of that predictive relationship between individual trash containers and um, mosquitoes and, and the number of mosquitoes on a block. So one of the one of our hypotheses, and this is something that we're still uh, working to unpack, is that we removed a, all the habitat we could pick up and take out. We did not do anything inside the abandoned building. So these are this is um, a picture where you zoom in and you can see that that these buildings are missing their roof. Um, we didn't go into those buildings. And so maybe we removed a bunch of low quality habitat that was easy to pick up and get rid of. Um, and the mosquitoes actually redirected resources or reproduction into better quality habitat. Um, we do know that Aedes albopictus is a, a it has a breeding strategy where if you give it 10 containers in the lab, it will tend to spread the eggs out across 10 containers versus laying the same amount of eggs in one container if it only had one container. So it's plausible. Um, and we did repeat the, we did do some trash removal across sites with a varying number of abandoned buildings. And it does seem consistent that if you're going to remove trash, you better make sure there's not abandoned buildings um, nearby. We did not necessarily um, get evidence for for a sink, a source sink, but for um, the certainty that if you remove a, a bunch of trash habitat, but you didn't get all of it, you might you might not have an effect. So in, in places with a lot of abandoned buildings, um, at a minimum, removing garbage that an average resident could move, such as the kind of tip it and toss it or whatever any uh, mosquito control agency or public health agency has instructed residents to do that the capacity for self-efficacy self is definitely biased by the condition of the neighborhood they're embedded in. Um, 
it's going to be much more effective in neighborhoods where everybody owns a parcel, there aren't abandoned areas in between, and there's no illegal dumping, let alone huge numbers of abandoned buildings. Um, so kind of quick summary, we've learned that that in these disinvested blocks, blocks where, where um, people didn't own their homes, so you have more uh, vacancy, more abandonment, and that has uh, a knock on effects for less investment and development, um, or it has had knock on effects for less investment, less development, less wealth accumulation uh, for the last century. And so we're seeing all of that um, very uh, viscerally in standing abandoned buildings and a lot of discarded unmanaged habitat. Um, however, when you get into the higher income blocks, we also noted that uh, wealth and infrastructure seems to moderate the environmental drivers. And so what do we mean? Environmental drivers are things that, uh, like the vegetation and the water availability, that you would expect to support more mosquito productivity. Um, if you pave a city over, very few mosquito species, pretty much only the yellow fever mosquito, can survive if there's no vegetation and there, there's very little water. Um, so we expect that as, as vegetation and precipitation increase in urban areas, you should see more mosquitoes. And this is work by Liza Little and her PhD. Actually, she showed that, that those investment uh, categories or investment in infrastructure mediates the effect of key environmental drivers or decouples the mosquito production from environmental drivers so that um, here we have mosquitoes and vegetation, and when you increase vegetation in those disinvested neighborhoods, so with a lot of abandonment, you get more mosquitoes, but when you see more vegetation in higher income neighborhoods, it doesn't increase the number of mosquitoes associated, um, it doesn't even have any effect within those higher income uh, neighborhoods where the, where the vegetation tends to be managed. Similarly, with precipitation. When you get more precipitation in the disinvested neighborhoods, you get more mosquitoes. When there's a drought, the mosquitoes disappear. In the high-income neighborhoods, we saw no effect of precipitation. Um, it, people add water when it's dry and they take water away when it's wet. And, and so those things are very hard to uh, predict and model at scale, but, but I think we're getting a better handle on it. So digging down into the vegetation a little bit, I, I think some visuals are always helpful are partially because one of the things we know from a lot of the literature and um, and expertise on, on what the kind of lasting effects of redlining are that uh, vegetation tends to, to be low in areas previously redlined or in lower income areas. Um, and this, this area, that would be true if you're going from our median income to our high income, but when you take the, the lowest income areas where you have a lot of abandonment into account, vegetation is actually pretty high. So one of these blocks is low income and one's high income, and you can't really tell which until you drill down and you see that the high income block, when you get into the alley, has um, water habitat that are that's really managed planters, and you do get some kind of uh, do-gooder kind of environmental greening habitat when, when uh, rain gardens and, and water storage infrastructures put in. Um, but when you drill down into the low income areas, again, you get those areas where you have buildings that don't have roofs. And if you look closely here, a lot of the vegetation is growing right out of those buildings that don't have roofs. So a lot of the vegetation is associated with the abandonment. And of course, the illegal dumping happens in those abandoned um, homes. And you can see that that, that this has a lot of abandonment, but but there's three homes here right in the middle um, where people are living. And so they're not completely abandoned. So we know that that juvenile habitat increases in the, with disinvestment and that this does result in more adult, adult mosquitoes, although there's some uh, questions about process and mechanism that we need to figure out um, there. And we also know that neighborhood wealth and um, an active human investment decouples the mosquito population and mosquito dry mosquito growth from the um, environmental drivers, which is interesting and, and source of a whole nother uh, socio-ecological study. So 
I'm going to end with a couple of slides about uh, are people, does that mean that people in um, these disinvested or low income neighborhoods are more likely to experience mosquito related risk? And for risk, we're going to focus for this talk very um, simply on the risk of arboviral disease of some sort um, and not the associated risks of avoiding nature, the stress of feeling um, like nature is dangerous or being outside is dangerous. Um, those, those are something else we're working on separately, but do, to know um, whether or not they're likely to, to cause increased transmission of virus um, or increased risk of exposure to disease, you have to know that they bite humans. You have to know if they live long enough to bite twice because they have to pick up the infection and then bite again. And then, of course, it's relevant mostly if a pathogen is present. Um, and as I said, we are looking at whether or not they change human behavior, but I'm not going to get into that really today. Um, so they are more likely to actually, these are our data on blood meals from those adult mosquitoes. This is just for Albopictus. Um, Culex showed similar patterns, and these are for human, the proportion of human blood meals. And so in our highest income, for the next several slides, I'm going to use pictures to show from the, the disinvested to the highly invested neighborhoods. Um, and you can see the proportion that bite humans, the proportion of human blood meals from our mosquito pools increases um, as you go from the lowest income up to the highest income neighborhoods. So they do bite humans, they do it more, um, they're more likely to bite humans in high income, although it's about the same number of human blood meals total because we had so many more mosquitoes in the low, lower income neighborhoods. What are they biting when they don't bite humans? Well, it turns out it's rats. And so there's about 80% of the blood meals in the low income um, neighborhoods came from rats. Uh, and and also the missing proportion in the higher income um, was predominantly rats. Cats and dogs and deer were also picked up in all of these, um, but it's mostly a rat versus human story. And we don't know what that means. Um, so do rats detract the mosquitoes from humans or are the humans just avoiding the mosquitoes in, um, or are, are there just more rats than, than humans? And both of those things may be true. Um, we do know that we ask humans in these neighborhoods, again, now the high incomes on the left, I apologize for the switch, and the low incomes on the right. We ask humans how much time they spend outside and when they are outside, where are you to try to see if, if human exposure is really just a measure of human density in these areas, which is actually about the same even with the abandonment. Um, and people in the higher income neighborhoods are more likely to uh, spend time outside in a yard or a garden than in the low income neighborhoods. Um, uh, fewer than 20% said they spent time outside in the yard or a garden. Where do they spend time? They spend time out in the front stoop in those neighborhoods, which look like this, and which when we sample for mosquitoes in between the road, in the roadside of the row homes is not where we find any. Um, so there's also an alignment issue of, we got a ton of mosquitoes, they're mostly biting rats um, because humans just don't wanna be in the same location where the rats and the mosquitoes are in those lower income areas. Do they live long enough to bite twice? There's not a great way to measure longevity in the field. Again, something that 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 we're and many other people are currently working on. So um, here I'm gonna talk about just longevity as kind of a function of size, which has been supported with some lab data and challenged with others. Um, these are two mosquito wings that show you how different the size of these mosquitoes can be. And this is work that was uh, worked up by a high school intern actually uh, here in my lab in New York, uh, measuring wings for a summer. And what she found was that now we're going from, from very low abandonment, so the higher income to the lower income, and the size of the uh, Aedes albopictus wing, and she found a positive association. So as you get into the more disinvested or lower income areas, the mosquitoes are actually bigger. Um, and in, in mosquito world, bigger means in general greater dispersal and and higher longevity. And so it's possible that that not only are more mosquitoes, but that they're actually um, better, uh, more fit and and uh, more capable of transmission in those lower income areas. Um, again, something we're, we're following up on now with uh, PhD Sarah Rothman's work, who also did this study looking at uh, West Nile virus infection. And so this is, uh, you know, we do know that West Nile virus is in the area. 
Um, this was 2015 and 16. We did not find chikungunya or Zika in those years in the area. Um, and the pool rate was, was fairly high, close to 10% in our low income, um, again here on the left. And as you got to the high income areas, um, slightly less in the albopictus, but about the same in the Culex. So we are finding West Nile virus. Um, incidentally, there's no records of West Nile virus in humans in these areas. It's very unlikely that that the residents that we know that are living in many of these neighborhoods would go to the hospital and be diagnosed with West Nile virus. But um, so those data are problematic. But so risk, we, we know something about risk um, from the vector data, right? We, we, we have lots of theory and, and understanding from lab studies to suggest that that if you have more mosquitoes, um, if those mosquitoes live longer, and if they bite the right things, then, then you should have greater risk, um, right things being human. Um, and so we know that, that, that this pattern of disinvestment on the landscape and the current differences in, in wealth in the landscape is associated with differences in potential risk, um, given the abundances of vector present and what they bite. Um, Things like West Nile virus are present. Um, we don't know what rats might carry. I'm, the idea that, you know, as I'm standing on those blocks and I know that if I'm bit by a mosquito, it lasts bit a rat is disturbing. Um, but currently not necessarily the source of, of uh, any real risk. Um, but there's a lot of buts for that, right? So so there's a lot we 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 still need to unpack. It's a, it's a complex system. Um, the human context, though, is what really kind of makes it difficult to to assign risk levels and and kind of make the the risk map for this area. Humans just don't want to spend time in the same places across these different neighborhoods. the The infrastructure is such that people want to be outside and they want to be in the green areas in um, neighborhoods that are more fully occupied and wealthier. Um, and those, and, and especially if they've had a history of wealth where where the unoccupied areas are green in a certain way, where they're, they're parks and they're cared for um, and the community uses them actively so there's no crime. All of that feeds into uh, people not using the green areas in these lower income neighborhoods. And, and one positive outcome is that they're also not getting bit by mosquitoes in those areas as uh, you know, they're they're less likely to get bit by mosquitoes um, in those areas, even though the, there are three times more mosquitoes present. Um, and we're we're really working now on unpacking the perception and action. What does it mean um, that that mosquitoes are? How are how are the mosquitoes playing into urban greening and support for uh, urban greening that's really necessary to make uh, change sustainable in these these areas? Um, but we do know that that in when we ask folks what are the top environmental risks in your neighborhood, um, in the locations where they had three times more mosquitoes in our traps, nobody reported mosquitoes in the top three, whereas um, over a third of the people in the other neighborhoods reported mosquitoes in the top three, even though they had much fewer mosquitoes. This is, of course, something that that's really important to note um, because certainly places with very limited funds and uh, capacity for managing mosquitoes, ha often have control strategies based around complaint and around residents calling in. Um, and, and so again, we highlight that these neighborhoods are, are disadvantaged for many reasons. Um, and, and they're also not the ones that are gonna be calling in mosquito problems. And so they're, they're not on the, the current record of places where, where mosquito populations are quite large and growing. Um, but they might be the place where where emergent pathogens get a handhold, get get a, a foothold, and amplify in the environment to a degree that makes them much more difficult to uh, to stop um, because there's no eyes on the ground in the sense of there's there's the whole mosquito community. Um, growing and potentially biting humans but but the residents in those neighborhoods don't have the same sense of self-efficacy efficacy and um 
and or expectation that that the city is going to come in and do anything that would lead one to report a mosquito problem. Um, and medical access is also very different. So the idea that that folks getting West Nile virus in those neighborhoods where we see West Nile virus fairly high in the mosquito pools, um, we know from other data that that this is not a population that's going to uh, be tested for West Nile virus uh, if they even did go in for, for the symptoms. On the other hand, the directly transmitted human diseases, um, chingunya, dengue, yellow fever, Zika, which currently still are predominantly brought in um, via travel uh, to places where they're endemic, brought into the US um, to, via travel through places that are endemic, require a mosquito to bite human twice, and that is much less likely to happen in, in this particular city in our uh, lower income neighborhoods where where people don't don't leave the country um, or travel to to places where these pathogens may be endemic um, as frequently. Again, we, we we also did surveys with with residents. And so um, folks in our lowest income neighborhoods were very unlikely to travel in any given year outside of the city, let alone outside of the country. Um, so again, risk is complicated, um, and and the more layers kind of we unpack, the less certain we are about how to how to kind of wrap this project up and and make that that risk map that we had hoped to do do at the start. Um, uh, but there's a lot more to learn, and and uh, you know I do science research so that can't ever be a bad thing. Uh, but legacies of disinvestment are certainly evident in the mosquito ecology, and we. We know that better understanding of what causes, what is that link between having more discarded containers um, per parcel and and having higher uh, density of biting females, mosquitoes on a block, what is that, that process uh, is important to understand in order to gui guide effective response and control strategies. How the juvenile habitat influences the size of adults, for instance, and what that size means is also really a critical unknown um, that that is a very important assumption often made in transmission models that are used to uh, both devise treatment strategies or or control strategies, but also understand what what the um, trajectory of uh, a new emergent uh, pathogen transmission cycle might be. Um, so there's lots of lots of really important uh, things we've highlighted that that need further study. Um, folks always are curious about the rats and, and what happens if you get rid of the rats. You know, there's there's several studies where on islands people have gotten rid of, have eradicated rats and seen the mosquito populations, uh, including Elbopictus, plunge. Um, it's not clear whether or not the rats are distracting mosquito bites from humans in these populations or, or even keeping the mosquitoes outside. These are often, even in the wealthier neighborhoods, row homes that, that don't have a, a tradition or culture of screens and air conditioning. Um, and, and then the idea of source sink dynamics and the potential for kind of perverse outcomes of uh, habitat removal. If you only remove the habitat, you can. Um, so with that, I would thank, again, all of the residents that participated. Again, we had a bunch of outreach components and, and engagement components that, that are a whole nother study trying to understand um, how residents in these, these communities perceive nature, how they interact with nature, and then how the mosquito exposure influences that, um, that are, are still being worked out. And of course, funders, uh, mostly National Science Foundation, USDA and uh, and the Northeastern Integrated Pest Management Center. And with that, I may have time for questions, but thank you so much for attending. So I do see one question in the chat. In the chat. When you 
are saying that people in lower income neighborhoods are less likely to be tested for Ibra viruses like what's now virus if they seek medical care. Why is this true? So in this setting where we we had several focus groups and we did um, these surveys and we asked people um, things about it, uh, their medical access. Um, and most of the most of the residents we spoke with um, would not go to you know having a mosquito-borne illness was not on their radar and flu-like um, kind of West Nile symptoms obviously not the neuroinvasive disease would not bring them to seek out medical attention um, very few people had a primary care practitioner so so this was um, predominantly through ER visits and uh, there's some literature that suggests that that ERs in urban areas are less likely to test for West Nile virus than uh, doctors in more suburban areas. There's a perception that it's less common, that it's not going to be a risk factor in more urban areas. And so it's just not tested for. It's actually something we worry about with Lyme disease as well. Um, I have a follow up question myself and Claudia. Claudia, you may be able to answer this one too. Um, is it because West Nile virus isn't as prevalent there? Because I, I wonder here, you said urban areas. So I wonder here in New Orleans, um, where we do get West Nile positives in our mosquitoes, are the hospitals not testing for that? No, so this is Claudia. So actually it's a reportable disease. So if um, someone goes, and I think there's pretty good awareness actually, um, and so if someone is having those symptoms, and again, the vast majority of people aren't going to be symptomatic. So, um, but the folks that are, you know, perhaps, you know, I, I actually do think we have good awareness. The other thing is our um, blood uh, gets pooled, right? If you donate blood, it gets pooled and there's automatic testing of that as well. So that also gives you a pretty good idea if there are asymptomatic cases. And in fact, in New Orleans this year, about a month ago, we did have a presently, we, we think the person was not symptomatic, um, but we had a blood donor. So uh, again, Stacey, I mean, I think we have pretty good awareness uh, in our region. Thank you. Yeah, the, the literature that I was referring to is mostly uh, more northern states. <laughs> um, I don't, there wasn't, Louisiana wasn't one of the states surveyed. Did, any, did anybody else have any other questions? Let's see, Stacey, do you see any more? Um. No, I don't see any more in the chat. I do have one more question myself. Um, I was listening when you were mentioning about, um, I think you were saying that the people in the lower e income areas were less likely to be hanging outside. Is, is that what you were saying? Yeah, so we asked people, um, we went door to door and did these surveys. And one of the questions we asked was, do you use shared community green space? Um, do you use the local park? Do you, uh, and then where, when you are outside, where do you spend time? And people in the neighborhoods that had really high abandonment um, and that kind of visual cue of infrastructure decay said that they weren't likely to use shared parks or green spaces, um, even though there are parks in, in, in each of these neighborhoods that the, the city tends to tends to, um, and that they were more likely to spend space on that front stoop. And so the culture of gathering was a front yard. These aren't yards in the sense of um, kind of green space, but but of stoops right on the road. That's what the, the culture of gathering in a lot of these neighborhoods is. Um, and and as we moved into to the, what were the higher income, um, 
neighborhoods where everybody had a yard with uh, a backyard that was often gated and green um, with tended plants and things, that's where they wanted to spend time. We sampled in both sides of the row home and we didn't find as many mosquitoes on the, we, we almost found no mosquitoes on the impervious side. Our traps found mosquitoes on the green side. Um, so it was a misalignment of where people spent time, even though it was still their parcel, it was still their yard. Um, the, the structure itself seemed to be a barrier to the mosquitoes, but it was also a barrier to the people. Does that? Yeah, that clears it up. Thank you. Great. Well, super interesting. I think there's, you know, we've done lots of surveys here as well, especially with um, actually with abandoned tires and I know with insecticide use. So I know I need to go back and read those publications because it'll be super interesting to see how it may be parallels or not. I will tell you, I think uh, we've done some projects here to look at what I think Mark Genowicki is on the line to look at what our uh, mosquitoes are feeding on. <laughs> and I don't believe that he has seen so many rodent uh, blood meals. Um, so it'll be interesting ultimately to, to see what, what happens here. But anyways, I don't wanna keep everybody, it's already 304, but we are so appreciative that you came and shared this information with us. Um, we love that everyone you know joins in. And so again, um, for any of those that are on the line, and you're not on our email list, we're at education at NOLA.gov. So if you want to get notified of upcoming events and really wonderful webinars like these, I think it's super important. And again, if anyone has any additional questions that you think of and we need to get them to Dr. Ledoux, please you know, email education at NOLA.gov and we'll make sure to put you in contact with her. Stacey, do you have any other final um, notices for the group? No, um, our survey is up. If you haven't had a chance to take it yet, um, you can use your phone and um, use the QR code to access it. And just also just follow us on our social media platforms because we post a lot of things, a lot of our upcoming webinars, a lot of rodent um, proofing tips, mosquito tips, things like that. So we're very active on our social media. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Ledoux. Appreciate all your time and thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> thank you.